Good morning and welcome in the name of our Lord Christ to this service of worship. Uh, today is the first Sunday in Lent. Uh, you may have noticed that the pyramids and stoles have changed colors. We've gone to purple, which is uh, understood as a, a penitential color. Uh, the season of Lent is penitential in that we are thinking about uh, our need for Easter. We are ourselves sinners and in need of the promise that is made and kept at resurrection, and that is that God in Christ defeats death, death which is the wages of sin. And so it is a penitential season. In some years we've been accused of it being uh, too penitential, and uh, uh, even the adjective medieval was uh, used uh, about our uh, Lenten services one year. Uh, we do not want that to be the case because we are, in fact, always thinking about Easter, uh, Easter which is coming, Easter which is the promise made and kept in Christ. And so if we consider our sins during this season, it is only so that we might be ready uh, for the joy that comes on that special day. Since it is uh, the Lenten season, we begin a new Sunday school class, a uh, new series uh, in the conference room, uh, you'll want to be a part of that. If you've been a part of that Sunday school class, you know that it's a, a free wheeling discussion, uh, lots of uh, thought and attention, and so uh, you'll be a part of that if you would like uh, in the conference room. Today is also a day when we were, will ordain and install officers, uh, deacons and elders in our church. Uh, all of the ones who are to be ordained and installed are coming at the later service, so we will not have the pleasure of doing that at this hour, but we do want to remain in prayer and be thoughtful about the lives of those who are making special commitments. You'll see also uh, that we are uh, there under welcome, it says, Mission Peacemaking Emphasis called Holy Joe's Cafe. Uh, that's actually uh, an error, and it occurred in a funny way. Maybe most errors are, are funny. Uh, uh, the, days of East, uh, the days of March and the days of February are always the same, except on leap years, of course. And so uh, when we got to talking about the 17th, uh, we were really thinking of the 17th of March, which is also a Sunday. Holy Joe's Cafe, as you may know, is an emphasis of our peacemaking committee to provide uh, quality coffee to uh, our servicemen uh, fighting, especially in Afghanistan just now. And so you'll hear more about that in a month, but uh, today's uh, a good preparation to be thinking about that. God calls us, uh, God forgives our silly mistakes and gives us strength for the living of these days. Let us worship God.
please stand and join me in the opening sentences. Because you have made the Lord your refuge. For God will command his angels concerning you. God will deliver those who love God. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. Join me in praying the unison prayer of adoration and confession printed in your bulletin. We begin Lent in a wilderness of our own making, burdened by sin, blinded by your own misdeeds. We no longer see the way ahead clearly. We stumble and fall. We are aimless, foolish, and lost. Meet us in your foolishness, we pray, and restore us to our right minds, for your saving love is stronger than death, and Easter joy is joy indeed. Amen. This morning, we can rejoice. We can rejoice because our God walks with us, walks with us through the wilderness, walks with us through the joy, walks with us through the pain, walks with us in our brokenness. This morning, we can rejoice because our God says, you have mercy, you have grace, you are forgiven and made new. This morning, we rejoice because our God gives us life. Amen.
since God has forgiven us and has said, I walk with you. Let us walk with one another and show that love and that peace to each other through the passing of the peace. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. I guess I wasn't supposed to say. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord, we give thanks for this beautiful Sunday morning, and we open our ears to hear your word, our minds to receive your word, and our hearts to live by your word, so that we will always be known by your word. Amen. Join me in the Psalter from Psalms 91 about God's promise of protection for those who make the Lord their refuge. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High who abides under the shadow of the Almighty. The Lord himself is your refuge. You have made the Most High your stronghold. For he will command his angels to keep you in all your ways. You will tread on the lion and the adder. The young lion and the serpent will trample underfoot. When he calls upon me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and bring him to honor.
We turn now to the gospel reading, which is traditional for this, the first Sunday in Lent, the story of Jesus being tempted by Satan in the wilderness, uh, a strange story in so many ways, and one that uh, encourages us, I think, to face up to our own sinfulness and to not back down, but rather to triumph with our Lord Christ. Let us stand together for the reading of the gospel. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where for forty days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during those days, and when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, One does not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, To you I will give their glory and all this authority, for it has been given over to me, and I give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil took Jesus to the Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to protect you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against the stone. Jesus answered him, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. And this is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. There's an amusing legend that's uh, told about the 16th century reformer Martin Luther It is said that Luther managed to resist the temptations and the abuse of a vision of the devil that he saw by throwing an inkwell at Satan. Luther was working in Wartburg, Germany, preparing a translation uh, of the New Testament into German. He is said to, uh, he is actually known to have said, I drove the devil away with ink which probably meant the ink on the page of the New Testament translation he was writing. But the idea that Luther actually lobbed a whole bottle of ink at a vision of the devil and smashed that bottle up against a wall is just too good and too much fun to give up. Luther is just the most famous practitioner of what is really an ages-old practice of faith, and that is the act of ridiculing the devil. Luther is also known to have said, I often laugh at Satan, and there's nothing that makes him so angry as when I attack him to his face and tell him that through God I am more than a match for him. Harvey Cox, in his book, When Jesus Came to Harvard, has a chapter on this temptation of Jesus by Satan in the wilderness, and he calls that chapter riffing on the devil. Riffing is a word borrowed from jazz musicians. Riffing is improvising, decorating, mastering the music. If you riff on something, you transcend it. So how can we in this Lenten season overcome evil? How can we resist and master evil and what evil has done to us? How will we riff on the devil? All three of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, give an account of Jesus being tempted by Satan in the Judean wilderness. Matthew and Luke both say that Jesus was led up or as Luke puts it, merely led into the desert by the Holy Spirit. 
But the gospel writer Mark sort of forces the issue just a bit because Mark says that the Spirit of God drove Jesus out, drove Jesus out into the wilderness. Now I know that that sounds like Jesus was coerced or forced against his will as if Jesus was the victim in this occasion. But I really think if we stop and think about it, it will not do for us to assume that Jesus was powerless in the midst of his temptation. In fact, this word to drive out that the gospel writer Mark uses, he uses only two other times, and both of those times are to describe events in which Jesus casts out or drives out an evil spirit. It is the divine power for good that's on display when Jesus is tempted, not the power of the evil one. Obviously, when all is said and done, Satan has no power over Jesus. But do you think evil is really an appropriate object for ridicule? Can we really riff on the devil or even riff on sin? The biblical Greek word for sin literally means missing the mark. With sin, our aim is bad. The correct path we should be following is lost, and everything is just off a little bit. In Aristotle's poetics, he uses the term to describe a tragic flaw, a tragic flaw of character which inevitably unravels into disaster. There is then nothing proud about sin. One of the chief harms it does is that it makes us look and feel foolish about those temptations that Jesus suffered. The devil says to Jesus, if you are the Son of God, command a stone to become a loaf of bread. Well, that's really small potatoes, isn't it? Uh, For the Son of God, it's hardly worthy. And then the devil offers the glory and authority of all the kingdoms of the world. But it's not clear that the devil really has all that authority to give. The offer that evil extends is always an empty offer, isn't it? And finally, it's the height of the devil's misunderstanding and of his missing the point when he goes to quote scripture to tempt the Lord. He says, throw yourself down from the temple and he will give his angels charge of you. He's quoting the 91st Psalm. It is the nature of sin and evil to contort and twist us into shapes like a clown with a balloon, so that we will no longer recognize ourselves. The first humans, Scripture says, were created by God for a place in paradise. But we lost our way. We went aimless. We lost paradise when we got led astray. That's what lies still do to us. It's what anger does. It's what temptation drives us to nothing good. It's no wonder that when a bad deed gets uncovered, our chief feeling is shame. We have indeed been made the fool. The first person ever to be legally judged not guilty by reason of insanity was a Scotsman named Daniel McNaughton in 1843. And the details of the case are that McNaughton couldn't really tell in his own mind if he was really a lowly woodworker or perhaps he was the object of a grand international conspiracy involving the Tory political party and the Prime Minister of England and the Pope. He was so 
driven crazy by this delusion that he attempted to kill the prime minister. But he missed, and he killed the prime minister's secretary instead. I mentioned McNaughton and what is truly a sad story, of course, to illustrate that sin, in this case the sin of murder, is not just bad, not just evil, it's also crazy. Sin twists and contorts us. It makes us fools. In some fundamental sense, we are each of us well and truly guilty by reason of insanity. Albert Vanden Heuvel, who served for several decades with the World Council of Churches, observed that that at which we cannot laugh has become an idol for us. And that's really the whole kernel, isn't it? We must be very careful about giving the devil his due because the devil is due nothing from us. It has been a persistent heresy down through the ages to understand the cosmos, the universe, in terms of two competing powers, the power of good, the power of evil as if evil might from time to time actually have the upper hand. Perhaps we can imagine that. We can imagine that evil is winning, but we don't believe it. There is, after all, a moral arc to the universe, and that moral arc bends in the direction of God's justice and God's righteousness. And then... Then there is Easter and the resurrection and the message of that bright, bright morning which is that evil has done its worst and yet God has still triumphed gloriously. We may even want to question whether the devil exists at all. At the very least, we'll agree that there is no red, horned, tailed, cloven-hooved character running around. Our spiritual forebear, John Calvin, accepted the reality of a devil, but he was very clear that the Lord God has reins and a bridle on him. Well, that too, the picture of God with reins and a bridle on Satan, is really a fanciful, imaginative picture too, God who created all things holds all things in sway. Every day God's will is being done and in the fullness of time we will surely see God's perfection. Of this we are certain even as we are quite uncertain about ascribing any authority to evil. Martin Luther again. Luther says the best way to drive out the devil if he will not yield to texts of scripture is to jeer and flout him for he cannot bear scorn. And Sir Thomas More, the man for all seasons, wrote, the devil, that proud spirit, cannot endure to be mocked. We are all guilty by reason of insanity when we turn our backs on God. So what might our strategy be now? Well, to begin with, I think we should learn to laugh at ourselves. Our lies, our many unkindnesses, the predicaments we've backed our ourselves into, the failures we've made of things, the distance by which we have fallen short in so many ways, all of those things are laughable. By our smallness, we have made ourselves small. By our prejudices, we have shown our ignorance. By our attempts to take advantage, we have demonstrated how desperate we really are. Sin has made fools of us. It's funny. No, it's not. Yes, it is. No, it's not. Secondly, when we've laughed at ourselves for a while, we should also poke fun at power. Why not? People who exercise power, our politicians, our bosses, 
our spouses, whoever, they often do it all wrong. Sometimes they're in it for themselves to maintain a selfish control or to keep others at bay beneath them. The selfish exercise of power is a desperate dead-end game. It is successful but only for a temporary time, and it is a bitter-tasting success at that. The selfish and the powerful deserve our derision. Thank goodness for political cartoons and the late-night monologues and the satirical essayists who prick the balloon of overinflated egos and bring them back to earth. Does Jesus laugh at the devil? Well, no. Uh, He's perhaps too kind for that. Jesus just consistently holds up the glorious majesty of Almighty God so that the devil might see that he can never, never, ever measure up. You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve, says Jesus. And so the devil goes away until an opportune time. The opportune time may have come at Jesus' arrest. It may have come when Jesus was jeered at and and punished and 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 tortured, and a crown of thorns set on his head, or or when he was crucified. The opportune time might have come those three days when Jesus lay still and silent in the tomb. Those were certainly occasions when evil was on full display. But of course, of course, even then, evil did not win. We do not talk of Jesus' death without also talking about Jesus' resurrection. If, as the Apostle Paul says, the wages of sin is death, then what do you suppose is resurrection to life, except it is the defeat of death, it is transcending death and its power, it is riffing on the devil. In his epic poem, The Divine Comedy, Dante reports on climbing from hell to purgatory. And when Dante draws near to the celestial sphere of heaven, he hears a sound he's never heard before. And he says simply, it is the laughter of the universe. Evil does not deserve our allegiance. It may not even deserve our attention. It is, after all, a defeated power, but because it is so wrong and it is so off the mark, it surely deserves our ridicule and our laughter. And thanks be to God this day. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, somewhere along the way we were all taught to be afraid of the devil. And surely there are many things in our world that do frighten us. Help us, though, to take a different perspective. Help us to recognize that in the midst of those fears and in the troubles we endure, in the problems we have, in the sin we cause and experience, there is yet a power greater, and it is demonstrated to us in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Bless us then to think about these things and to find courage and strength in our faith. And these things we pray in the name of our Lord Christ. Amen.
affirmation of faith this week is drawn from a declaration of faith in the fourth chapter. Let us together say what we believe. Jesus was God in the flesh. Jesus Christ overthrew evil powers that enslaved and degraded people. Yet he made no use of power to protect himself. He healed those who were sick in body and mind. Yet he did not avoid pain and suffering for himself. He commanded his followers to place loyalty to him above loyalty to family and country, yet he lived among them as a servant. Jesus taught with authority, challenging the many time-honored customs and ideas, yet he submitted to humiliation and death without a word on his own behalf. He forgave sinners, and yet he was counted among sinners. We recognize the work power and authority. He did what only God can do. We also recognize the work of God in Jesus' lowliness. When he lived as a servant and went humbly to his death, the greatness that belongs only to God was manifest. In both his majesty and lowliness, Jesus is the eternal Son of God, God himself with us. Amen. And please be seated. Let us continue in prayer. Lord, on this first Sunday in Lent, we come praying to you from the deserts of our lives. For some of us, it's a painful wilderness. For some, it's a wild and creative place. For some, it is a silent beauty. Lord, we pray for your guidance, presence, and shelter as we journey these days of Lent. Help us to deal with temptation. Keep us from falling into our old traps and deliver us from darkness. Lord, we pray for our communities where hardship is present, where there are the homeless, where there is traumatic violence, where there are job losses and fear. Pour your tender mercy into our communities so that they may have justice that rolls down like water. Lord, we pray for our country with the divisions, discontentment, financial problems abound. Pour your tender loving mercy into our nation, healing and redeeming us. Oh God, we pray for our world where there is starvation, poverty, ongoing war, slavery and abuse of power. Pour out your tender loving mercy into our world so that your kingdom may come and your will be done. Merciful God, we lift up to you those with illness, those with unmet needs, those with financial problems, those with brokenness in their lives. May your tender, loving mercy be poured into their lives, into the places it's most needed, like warm, soothing, salve. Help us, O oh God, to remember that you are in the midst of these times giving hope and love. Enable us to feel the power of this love in our lives. Empower us to share this love with others. We pray all these things. In the name of the one who taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. If you think of all the things that our church does inside the church and outside the church and outside the country, it gives you an opportunity to join in these things with your offerings. Some of those are the ministry to people sleeping under the bridge. We go down there again on Tuesday the 26th. There's a display now in the fellowship hall of the items that we have uh, 
we take to Guatemala with us on a display board. We'd like you to go by and see that today. We'll be leaving on March the 20th. Uh, two weeks ago, we served Saturday meals. The transitional house is ready for its new occupant. And we continue direct support through our food pantry and through Churches United in Christ Help Ministry. As we make our gifts, we join in with each other to accomplish God's purpose here. As we are united in Christ by the Spirit, we are invited to do Christ's work. In faith, let us come before God with our tithes and offerings. We bring these gifts to you, O God, in recognition and gratitude for your loving provision. We offer to you our very lives and bow before you in the tribute to your many blessings. Take us and use us, that your will may be done on earth as it is in heaven.
And so go out of the world in peace and have courage and hold on to that which is good. Return no person evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And the grace and mercy and peace of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be with you, each one, and abide with you forever. Amen.